नमस्तुहकम सत्यम परम धीमहि ओ माय लॉर्ड श्री कृष्ण सन ऑफ वासुदेव ओ ऑल प्रवेडिंग पर्सनालिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड आई फ्रॉम माय रिस्पेक्टफुल बेस इज नॉट टू यू I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes. Of the creation, sustenance and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there's no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion, as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire on land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes. temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature appear factual although they are unreal i therefore meditate upon him lord shri krishna who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode which is forever uh, which is forever free of of the illusory representations of the material world I meditate upon him for he is the absolute truth. Drama projita kaitra vocha. Paramon yamatsanam satam. Vedyam vastavam atra vastu. Shivadam tapa trayon mulanam. Shimad bhagavate mahamuni krite. Kim va parer ishwaraha. Sadyo hridi avarudya te cha Kriti bihi susu subhistakshana Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kaputaror galitam falam, sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam, pibata Bhagavatam rasamalayam. Mohor aho rasika bhuvi bhavakaha. O expert and thoughtful man, relish Shrimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to read Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all. including liberated souls chinvatan swakata krishna punya shravana kirtana adiyan taksto hi padrani vidu nati srihit satam to hear about krishna from vedic literatures or to hear from him directly through the bhagavad gita is itself righteous activity and for one who hears about krishna lord krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart acts as a best wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him 
Nasta Presu Badresu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Tamasloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. <clears throat> As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam, and from the devotees. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajastamo Bhava Kamalo Badayas Chaye Chete Taranavidam Stitvam Satve Prasidati By development of devotional service of the Lord. I'm sorry, by development of devotional service, one becomes fixed, I'm sorry, one becomes, uh, yeah, free from the modes of passion and ignition. And thus material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha Bhagavat Tattva Vigyanam Mukta Sangha Sijayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness, becomes enlivened by devotional service, and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate Hirdaya Grantis Chidyante Sarvasam Saya Siyante Chasikarmani Drista Evat Manishwari Thus Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a Samsayam Samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, Verse Number 5. Sonako Uvacha Kashahetu Nijagraha Kalim Dig Vijaye Nripa Nirdeva Chinachina Trik Sudra Koso gamya padahanat Pratgat yatam ahabaga Yada Krishna katashrayam Translation by Srila Prabhupada. Sonakarisi inquired, Why did Maharaj Parikshit simply punish him? Since he was the lowest of the sudras, having dressed as a king and having struck a cow with his, with his leg, please describe all these incidents if they relate to the topics of Lord Krishna. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Sonika and the Rishis were astonished to hear that the pious Maharaj Pariksit simply punished the culprit and did not kill him. This suggests that a pious king like Maharaj Pariksit should have at once killed an offender who wanted to cheat the public by dressing like a king and at the same time daring to insult the purest of the animals, a cow. The Rishis in those days, however, could not even imagine that in the advanced days of the age of Kali, the lowest of the sutras will be elected as administrators and will open organized slaughterhouses for killing cows. Anyway, although hearing from a sudraka, who was a cheat and insulter of a cow, was not very interesting to the great Rishis, they nevertheless wanted to hear about it to see if the event had any connection with Lord Krishna. They were simply interested in the topics of Lord Krishna, for anything that is dovetailed with the narration of Krishna is worth hearing. 
There are many topics in the Bhagavatam about sociology, politics, economics, cultural affairs, etc. But all of them are in relation with the Lord, with Krishna, and therefore all of them are worth hearing. Krishna is purifying, is the purifying ingredient in all matters, regardless of what they are. In the mundane world, everything is impure due to being a product of the three mundane qualities. The purifying agent, however, is Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So in the 14th chapter, is a very interesting verse, Bhagavad Gita. Is the 14th chapter, let's see. No, okay. So, is it 15th chapter? Hmm. No, so it must be the 16th chapter. Yes. Mm. Well, it says, Daivi Sampat Vimokshaya Nirbandana Suri Mata Ma Sucha Sampadam Daivim Abhijato Si Pandava. The transcendental qualities are conducive to liberation, whereas the demonic qualities make for bondage. Do not worry. O son of Pandu, for you are born with the divine qualities. So here, Lord Prabhupada writes, Lord Krishna encouraged Arjuna by telling him that he was not born with demoniac qualities. His involvement in the fight was not demoniac because he was considering the pros and cons. He was considering whether respectable persons, such as Bhisma and Drona, should be killed or not. So he was not acting under the influence of anger, false prestige, or harshness. Therefore, he was not of the quality of the demons. For a Chatriya, a military man, shooting arrows at the enemy is considered transcendental, and refraining from such a duty is demoniac. Therefore, there was no cause for Arjuna to lament. Anyone who performs the regulative principles of the different orders of life is transcendentally situated. Okay, so this is an interesting point because uh, the uh, sages thought that Maharaj Parikshit should have killed immediately uh, the Sudra, who was dressing like a king and that he was basically torturing a cow. But for some reason or other, he didn't do it. And it's very interesting why. And this brings up a subject that bewilders some people, and that is that uh, in the Old Testament, the God of the Jewish people is, uh, in a sense, a vengeful God with some foibles of human beings. For example, he gets really upset in, in the, in the uh, beginning of the Bible, and he destroys the world, you know, with a big flood. Then he feels bad about it, and re recreates it again. So the depiction of God in the Bible uh, is misleading. And because of that, there's a lot of problems in Judaism and Christianity and Islam, because they're all in the same tradition. And they rely on the same, uh, let's say, history. 
where actually God is rewarding and punishing people all the time. And just like uh, recently, they had a big prayer uh, meeting in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, it was all outside uh, where all the great monuments are, the United States, the Lincoln Memorial and so forth, and the, the cemetery and all these different places and in front of the White House. So if you listen to the prayers, many of the prayers were saying, people who were praying were saying out loud, and they were all big ministers and priests and things, not priests, but they were all big ministers in the evangelical churches around the United States. They were all saying, you know, we are sinners. We have sinned against you, God. Please forgive us. And they were talking about abortion, and they were talking about all kinds of uh, sinful things. And they were begging for mercy that God forgive them. Is that bad? No, that's, that's good. But one thing they don't realize is that they are sinning in ignorance. Even the Christians. Otherwise, why are they always praying we are sinners? You say. Uh, so why do I say that? Well, one thing Prabhupada was pointing out all the time about Christianity was uh, in the Ten Commandments it says, thou shalt not kill. But yet, they're killing and eating meat. By the way, there are Christians who are vegetarians. Let's, let's make that point also. They're, but they're not, they're in a big minority. But there are Christians, there are orders of the Catholics, and there are other Christian groups that are strictly vegetarian. <clears throat> so here we see that sometimes they, they think that fish is, is vegetarian also. You know, so, like the Bengalis. <laughs> but uh, the majority of the Christians are meat eaters, and they have, you know, strong uh, biblical proof that you can eat meat, you know, although it's not true, but it's there by their misinterpretation. So Christians are also regularly committing sins, and uh, for the most part. And... And they're always praying to please God forgive us. Um, so this, uh, th th there are things missing in these religions, whether it's Islam or Christianity or Judaism. And, and therefore, bad things happen to good people, so-called good people. So here we can see that in Kali Yuga, very low-class people will be elected to the highest positions of authority. And what, what does Prabhupada say here? He says, The Rishis in those days, however, could not even imagine that in the advanced days of the age of Kali, the lowest of the Sudras will be elected as administrators and will open organized slaughterhouses for killing cows. And th this, is, this is a fact. The lowest people are being elected, and they are slaughtering cows, permitting the slaughter of cows. Not only slaughtering cows, slaughtering children. You see? Uh, because of Roe versus Wade, there are at least one million plus kids that are killed every year in the United States. That's the United States alone. If you count India, China, and all these other countries, it runs into many, many millions of, of uh, babies are being slaughtered. And they, uh, in a sense, support it. They find different reasons to say, you know, uh, it's a good thing to do. So, uh, with all this slaughtering going on of animals, of children, and now they even are permitting slaughtering old people. You know, if you want to die 
before you're supposed to die, you can go to Oregon State, where uh, it's permitted to uh, uh, have assisted suicide, which is, means murder. They have a nice word for it, assisted suicide, but it's actually murder of old people. So we have the young kids are being murdered, old people are being murdered, and massive numbers of animals, including cows, are being murdered. And so how can you expect such a, such a civilization or such a society to be prosperous and happy and uh, peaceful with so much murdering going on? It's not possible. And, and, and they have justifications for it, you know, the legal and philosophical justifications, which are all bogus. So... Killing someone is a very, let's say, serious thing. So you can see that someone of uh, Maharaj Pariksit's status is very uh, careful about killing someone. Even a, even a low-class person like this Sudra or the personality of Kali who was uh, torturing a cow and a bull. So then Prabhupada says... <clears throat> that uh, mm, he says, a pious king like Maharaj Pariksit should have at once, or this suggests that a pious king like Maharaj Pariksit should have at once killed an offender who wanted to cheat the public by dressing like a king and at the same time daring to insult the purest of the animals, a cow. <clears throat> so, uh, how do we, uh, you know, understand this? Well, we're, it's going to be explained in, in the next couple of verses. But the main point is that, and and this there's a very important verse in Bhagavad Gita, thirteenth chapter, verse twenty six. It says, "Again, there are those who, although not conversant in spiritual knowledge." begin to worship the Supreme Person upon hearing about him from others. Because of their tendency to hear from authorities, they also transcend the path of birth and death. And in the purport, Prabhupada says, this verse is particularly applicable to modern society because in modern society, there's practically no education in spiritual matters. Some of the people may appear to be atheistic or agnostic or philosophical, but actually, there is no knowledge of philosophy. As for the common man, if he is a good soul, then there is a chance, a chance for advancement by hearing. This hearing process is very important. Lord Chaitanya, who preached Krishna consciousness in the modern world, gave great stress to hearing because if the common man simply hears from authoritative sources, he can progress, especially according to Lord Chaitanya. If he hears the transcendental vibration, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. It is stated, therefore, that all men should take advantage of hearing from realized souls and gradually become able to understand everything. The worship of the Supreme Lord will then undoubtedly take place. Lord Chaitanya has said that in this age, no one needs to change his position, but one should give up the endeavor, the endeavor to understand absolute truth by speculative reasoning. One should learn to become the servant of those who are in knowledge of the Supreme Lord. If one is fortunate enough to take shelter of a pure devotee, hear from him about self-realization and follow in his footsteps, one will be gradually elevated to the position of a pure devotee. In this verse particularly, the process of hearing is strongly recommended, and this is very appropriate. Although the common man is often not as capable as so-called philosophers, faithful hearing from an authoritative person will help one transcend this material existence and go back to Godhead, back to home. He doesn't say, 
watching a movie will liberate you. He doesn't say going on pilgrimage will liberate you. He doesn't say getting degrees on, on, on Vedic study will liberate you. He says faithful hearing from an authoritative person will help one transcend this material existence and go back to Godhead, back to home. And this is what Lord Chaitanya especially has emphasized. Stane stutastu tikitan tanavan manobi. You just stay in your position, whatever it might be. You don't have to change your position. But go on regularly, every day, hearing and chanting. Uh, so the sages, they wanted to know, what does this low-class sudra torturing a cow have to do with Krishna? Now, this is a good question. You know, sometimes we do things and someone asks the question, wait a minute, what does that have to do with Krishna consciousness? Is this actually Krishna conscious or is it not Krishna conscious? You see? So this question by the sages is very important and this is something that each one of you can ask when a leader makes a decision, you have a right to ask, is, does this have anything to do with Krishna consciousness? You see? So, therefore, Prabhupada says, there are many topics in the Bhagavatam about sociology, politics, economics, cultural affairs, etc. But all of them are in relation with Krishna, and therefore all of them are worth hearing. Krishna is the purifying ingredient in all matters, regardless of what they are. In the mundane world, everything is impure due to its being a product of the three mundane qualities. The purifying agent, however, is Krishna. So, uh, this is a very important uh, purport today, uh, Prabhupada has written, because we should always ask ourselves, is what I'm doing, is it, is it in a relationship with Krishna or is it not? Right. Then again, uh, another interesting verse, I just wanted to quote here. Um, hmm. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, hmm. Take a look at the seventeenth chapter. I might not find this verse now. Look at the 18th chapter. No, I'm not going to find it. So we'll come back to it. So are there any questions anyone would like to ask? Yeah, there are Muslim vegetarians. Yeah. It's supposed to be vegetarian. I heard like recently in India, percentage of vegetarian people is increasing. And actually, in the Western world, percentage of vegetarian people is increasing. What is the reason behind it? Because Hindus, Hindus don't get any education anymore. They're not allowed to have uh, spiritual education in Hindu schools. The Muslims can have it in the Muslim schools in India. Christians can have it in Christian schools. But Hindus are not allowed to have religious education in their schools. If it's supported by the government. You know, if it's a government type of school, that's why. So then it's relegated to the temples. But in, in India, the uh, Brahmins don't really preach much. They preach a little bit, but not much. Huh? 
Yeah, they don't want to go bankrupt. If they teach, you know, they say, well, you know, these rituals that we're doing, this is not the real thing. You know, the real thing is you know, hearing from a bona fide authority. If they say that, they all go bankrupt. Right? So, so money talks, as they say in America. And uh, unless... Uh, they they change all these nonsense things. Uh, India, India is lost. So, Prabhu, tell your story again about your classmates, <laughs> your Hindu classmates. Yeah. Uh, pious family, Hindu pious, pious family, yeah. The grandmother probably doesn't eat meat. The uh, parents may eat meat outside of the temple, outside of the house. Both. Both. Well, I mean, look, the monkey, monkeys are vegetarians. <laughs> Does that mean there's like some big religious or a spiritual uh, person? No. They're vegetarian, but they engage in illicit sex all the time. Well, you can't say it's illicit for them, but the pigeons, pigeons are engaged in illicit sex all the time. So, you know, just being a vegetarian is not enough. It's, you have to be a Prashad Aryan. Then you are properly situated, a Prashad Aryan. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a big subject. Well, we spoke about it a little bit yesterday. That is that uh, uh, even something that looks like a punishment is not really a punishment. Like, for example, when Tulsi Devi, who was Manjari in Goloka, uh, was cursed to take birth in the material world. It looked like something really bad, right? But actually, it was so she could marry Krishna eternally. Krishna in the form of Shalagram Sila. So she couldn't do that as Manjari in the Goloka, but she could do it by coming to the material world. And now she's glorified. You can't, you can't make any offering unless you have a Tulsi leaf or some something related to Tulsi on the offering, otherwise Krishna won't accept it. Right. So uh, what looks like a curse is actually a blessing. And, uh, you know, her material husband uh, was also a gopa in uh, the spiritual world in Goloka, but he wanted to be with Tulsi. So he was able to marry her in the material world, but it wasn't, you know, eternal. And he acted like a demon, but he was killed by Krishna himself, so he went back to his original position. So we see that there is, there is possibility of people falling down from the spiritual world. But... Uh, there's mercy all the time, and it's, it's actually reward. It's not actually uh, punishment. But it looks like punishment, maybe, for people who don't understand. But if you hear the whole story, 
then you know it's actually was a uh, was mercy. So uh, there is a difference, though. I mean, there 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 are people who are evil, and they punish, and the and the, the intention of the punishment is to destroy a person. That's different. Whereas in Krishna consciousness, uh, there's no punishment. There's only reward. Something might appear like a punishment, but if you follow the story, you'll see it's actually a great benediction. Yeah. And we can talk more about that. There are many examples that we can talk about. Just like uh, Junior Haridas. Uh, uh, what's his name? Chota Haridas, yeah. He looked like Lord Chaitanya was really mean to him. You know, he wanted him to commit suicide. But after com committing suicide, he was singing for the Lord's pleasure. So then you see that he actually attained some kind of liberation. Although committing suicide is not permitted, right? It's just cons you, you become a ghost. But uh, he was, uh, you know, after his death, he was chanting uh, for Lord Chaitanya. So it's not, you know, if Lord Chaitanya sanctioned him to commit suicide, there was a purpose behind it. And uh, he came closer to the Lord by doing that. So, but normally suicide is a very sinful thing to do. So there are all these, there's all these uh, histories, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srimad Bhagavatam, we have to carefully read them, and then you'll see there's no there's no actual punishment in Krishna consciousness, only reward. Because whatever looks like punishment in Krishna consciousness, it's for kicking the person up, not kicking them down. Whereas in the material world, when people punish, usually it's to kick them down. Right? Okay, Haribo, yeah. Any, anyone, although hearing about the Shudraka, who was a, a cheat, told him, uh, was a what? Was a cheat. Yeah. Uh, and then being sold, but now uh, was not very interested. He regrets the wishes. Yes. But nevertheless, I'm here because he, it's friends making action. So my question is. How can you define the thing which is mundane and which is not in the nature? Like you see in Babylon, we have so many, many stories that appear to be like weirdly, but in the Babylon, like some people go, oh, oh, this. Is. Yeah. So how can you define it? Any, any, anything which is mundane. Anything speculative is not connected to Krishna. Like, for example, if you read Harry Potter, does that have any connection to Krishna? I don't think so. <laughs> right? Or if you watch a movie called, you know, Terminator 3, does that have anything to do with Krishna? Or if you hear somebody's... Uh, you know, a politician's speech, and they're talking about, you know, and everyone will have a chicken on your plate and a washing machine in your house. And, you know, does that have anything to do with Krishna? No. So anything speculative is not connected to Krishna. Just like Einstein says, I don't believe in a personal God, but yet I believe in God. Okay, so <laughs> what does that mean? You know, he doesn't believe in a personal God. So, so what? You don't believe in a personal God. That's your that's your misfortune. That has nothing to do with the re with reality. So anything speculative is not going to be in relationship with Krishna. I heard this, you know. Uh, people say when the Christian conscience, 
No, he has, if he recites the prayer, Rasaham Absakuntea, Bhavasmi Bhavasmi Sasisura. Yeah, I'm I'm the taste of water. I'm the, no, I know, but beer is made up mostly of water, right? So I am the taste. Rasaham Apsukuntea. So, okay, so you, you, you know, actually, everything in existence has a connection to Krishna, everything. Now, some people know that and some people don't. The speculators don't know it. They speculate that no, there's no, no God. Right? So, whenever you speculate, you lose that connection to Krishna. But everything has a connection to Krishna. There's nothing independent of Krishna. So that's the other point. So therefore, if you use some, you can take anything and use it in Krishna's service, uh, that is Krishna consciousness. But, you know, you have to do it the right way. There's always a right way and a wrong way. Yeah, it, and, and prostitution is not allowed either, but yet there's prostitutes in Dwarka who are Krishna conscious. Pingala, she's a prostitute story in the Bhagavatam, she's Krishna conscious. So uh, everything has a connection to Krishna, see, that's the thing. There's nothing that's not connected to Krishna. But if you speculate, then the, the connection is lost. Basically, what you call speculation is that you from you to from the action again. It's your injunction. Yeah. That is. Well, speculation. Right, right, right. So everything has a connection to Krishna. As soon as your mind becomes clouded and you don't see the connection to Krishna, that is Maya. What about if the body is falling in no where fully aware regulated principle which weakness of the the actual working but they know that. In order to break a principle, you have to forget Krishna. And the only way you can forget Krishna is if Krishna helps you. I think that's for long term, all right. But short term, everybody will do it occasionally or due to weakness. He knows that, well, I should be doing this, but some or other can help it. Goes for it, then with, with regret, of course, we be craving that we be doing this. I know, I know one one very silly friend that who was a witness with smoking. He couldn't help it. Yeah, and then he spoke to me. He very senior. Say about. Um, yeah, what did you say? Uh, what I say? No, actually, no, that's somebody else, sorry. It was something about uh, wearing. And I said, well, the difficulty. You know, you go to the temple, you know that you should be wearing, but what can you do it? And then, uh, yeah, you're right. So did he stop? No, he acknowledged. He acknowledged that he should be doing. Well, then, did he? Did he have a dodi on the next day? Uh, I think so. I can't remember exactly. After that, but 
at least if you want the conversation, if you mention that. Okay, so that's called whimsicalness. Whimsical. You know what's right, but still you do what's wrong. Now, what about this? Again, it's whimsical. You know it's wrong, but you still you do it. So this explains sixteenth chapter, you know. Yashastra Vidim Uchidja Vati Kamakarataha Nasasidim Abapnodpi Nasukam na Paramgatim. It says he who discards scriptural injunctions and acts according to his own whims attains neither perfection nor happiness nor the supreme destination. So in the purport, Prabhupada explains that he says the word karma karata is very significant. A person who knowingly violates the rules acts in lust. He knows that this is forbidden, but still he acts. This is called acting whimsically. He knows that this should be done, but still he does not do it. Therefore, he's called whimsical. Such persons are destined to be condemned by the Supreme Lord. Such persons cannot have the perfection which is meant for the human life. The human life is especially meant for purifying one's existence, and one who does not follow the rules and regulations cannot purify himself, nor can he attain the real stage of happiness. So such a person is overwhelmed with lust. What about this being weak? Yes, but see, why stay weak? Yeah, there's a person. There, and that, that, there means that there has to be some fault in their practice of Krishna consciousness. So if he, if he can't put on, uh, if he can't stop smoking, it also means that he's probably not chanting his rounds. It's not, the, it's not only one thing, right? There's a, there's, the, the ultimate problem is not strictly following the regulative principles. That, that, that's the original cause. And, and, you know, not putting on the clothes or smoking a cigarette, that's, that's a secondary thing. There's a bigger issue. That, just like someone who drinks water underwater on a fast day. Right? So they're actually breaking the fast, but they're doing it in a way that no one sees them. Well then, but we know, we can tell later on, something else will show that this person is not actually following the regulative principles. Like they get angry quickly or they do something that's really strange that, you know, no devotee would, would do. So it, it comes by, it, it happens because privately they're breaking some principle. That you don't see that. But then you see it in another way, and they're not strictly following uh, different principles in Krishna consciousness. There is a verse in the seventh Yeah. In the text 27, 28. Okay. Having awakened faith. Generation, my being disgusted with all material, knowing that all sense gratification leads to music, but still being unable to renounce sense my devotee to remain happy, or she be in that place, even though he is sometimes engaged in sense my devotee knows that all sense. It's miserable, and he sincerely ends. That's what I'm talking about. No, okay, the last line is significant. What does it say? He? My devotee knows that all sense gratification is. No, 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 the last line. The last line. And he sincerely repents. Such he sincerely repents. Yeah, but he's doing it. He isn't it. No, no, no. After, what does it say after he sincerely repents? 
The last line. Yeah. What's it say? Yeah, no, it says that he repents and then he stops. He repents, he stops activity. Yeah, and he stops. I don't say this part. Read the last line. Um, he sincerely repents such a while he's doing it, he repents. I think that's my understanding because previously uh, he said that he knows, but he is unable to renounce. He's unable to renounce all such, uh, to renounce all sense enjoyment. My devotee should remain happy and worship me perfect and perfection. Even though he sometimes, you see, even though sometimes, um, engage in sensation. So during that process, being unable to renounce, He's doing it. It appears that he's, he knows that he's not happy doing that, but he repented. Do you know what repent means? Yeah, I know that you know something. Look it wrong. up in a dictionary. Repent has a specific meaning to it. Well, by Mario, it, what about just what he's, he's doing it. He, he knows. He knows that not good, but it's unable to renounce it. What's it say? Okay. So what is your point? That someone can be like that forever? No, no. My point is that uh, uh, see, like when when a no con a no conscious person is is continually engaged, but the other person but he's unable he knows what to do everything, but he is feeling uh, half of his half of his arms, those activities, so he's regretting. While performing those, so, but yeah, uh, but because you mentioned oh, the point of making this a Christian, Christian does reject, uh, because you mentioned something that if you do something whimsical, it's because of lust, yeah, because of lust, and reject. But here, you said, he calling that such a person might be born. That means he's. Uh, where are you quoting from? This is 11 Kanto, uh, chapter 20, universal service, very important chapter. And then the text 27. 11, what chapter? Uh, I think 20. And what verse? 22 verse. But what is your point from that? You're making a point. Does it mean that one can go on continually being like that? No, no, no. I'm just, my point is about a difference. Because we're talking about somebody like to early on, about somebody drinking, appreciating Krishna. And here, we have, we have somebody who's conscious of that what he's doing, activities performing are not conducive, but because what he says here, that by he's unable to renounce, uh, unable to renounce the sense of enjoyment. So he's unable, unable to renounce. So by he's, he's engaging in so called mature activities. Okay, when you say, what, does that mean he's never going to renounce? No, the ultimate goal is to renounce. Yeah. To come to that point, that's just like... You're just saying that, okay, Krishna can't accept that there's a person like this. Well, I'm just trying to figure it out. We have a conscious that person is unable to. So he, he's a, 
Why is unable to love? Because of lust. Uh, it's something you worship in Krishna. I know it's, it's because of lust. And therefore they act whimsically. But my point is, there are other things that that person is doing that you don't see. What you're seeing is just a, a secondary part of it. There's a bigger thing. They're not chanting their Gayatri, or they're not chanting their rounds, or they're not following all the regulative principles. Because if you follow all the regulative principles, then you're able to follow everything. Like drinking water underwater on a fast day, you don't see the person breaking the principles. By who? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, what's he say? The beginning, uh, the uh, beginning stage of Sincere body has practically seen that too much. He only sense by application, no sense by it only is. Thus, a devotee of sincere desire has put out the loving service of Krishna without any personal motive. The devotee of sincere desire is to And he prays to the Lord to elevate him. Is the Lord. The way Anishwara was indicated that was once that habit I mean not immediately. And drawing the Lord here encourages such a body not to be overly impressed. But man has to and to go on with his loving service. Where Nirvina indicates that the body could go somewhat entangled in permanent sense, is completely disgusted with real life and under no circumstances, really it's simple. In fact, he avoids any kind of the word man basically sets back in the form of children and within the material world, the sex was strong, even the sex and loving sex for men sometimes. Sex action by lingering sentiment. Lingering. A lingering sentiment. Why? A pure devotee certainly feels spiritual old and including so for my children. He knows your family attraction needs no good. Simply single one singles and one so called quality in musical and reaction including the word Rudan is child can be fast indicates that in any second body will be determined to go on with it by duties. Thus he thinks that my previous shameful life, my heart is pure, many people personally have no power to speak. Only Lord within my heart can remove such inauspicious. But whether the Lord removes such judgments immediately or let me go on afflicted by them, I will never give up my service. Even if the Lord places millions of obstacles in my path, and even if it was my good, I will never promise. I'm not interested in mental situation, even if Lord Brahma personally comes to offer such a I will not lightly enjoy 
So I'm attached to few things. I can see very clearly that they lead to wrong place, if trouble, but I feel left. I see so many questions, so many things. And I'm patiently Interpreter indicates that the body will exactly like the sun for the subject with body and very attached to the patient. Therefore, although since you have learned in the edging of that in the sense, he never gives up. He's enthused. So, if the body becomes too morose or have it, he may trick into an impersonal consciousness, give up personal Yeah, the Lord here advises that although one should be sincerely repent, he should not come to One should understand because of this past sin, he must occasionally suffer the disturbances of your mind and senses, but one should not be. Therefore, become a devotee as to the speculative world. Although one may desire, although one may desire detachment, if I want to if one becomes more concerned with initiation than with acting, pleasure. Is misunderstanding of faith in Lord Krishna is so powerful that in due course of time he will automatically attack you and perfect time. If one gives up the Lord Krishna, that's the main point right there. So, in other words, even though he's not following, he doesn't blame Prabhupada, he doesn't say the, uh, the, the process doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, he realizes it's his own weakness, and but he doesn't give up. And he has faith that if he just continues somehow or other, even though there's some uh, occasional fall downs, that he will attempt uh, attain complete uh, purification of those uh, desires. Yeah, he doesn't. You see, what what people do is. They say, oh, Prabhupada didn't know. You know, he didn't understand, you know, American culture and modern times. He's still living in the 1890s, and uh, what he brought to America is not doable. So <laughs> that, there, are, there are devotees that have written books like that. They're initiated. You know, they probably had first and second initiation, but then they come to this, those type of conclusions, you see. So the speculators... The speculators are the ones that are uh, cutting off relationship with Krishna. But if someone is genuinely weak, but yet does, has faith that the process is correct, it's just their weakness, they can make spiritual advancement. But if someone speculates and says, well, Prabhupada didn't know what he was doing, you know, he was, he's living in the 1890s, but this is, you know, uh, 2020, and uh, there are realities now that he didn't know about. So those type of arguments that devotees have made, they've even written, written, wrote books like that, right? Uh, they, they cut off their relationship due to speculation. Prabhupada didn't understand. That's their point. You know. <laughs> but somebody who is breaking the principles, but they say, look, it's my fault. I, I know it's wrong. I feel very bad about it. I just can't stop. Uh, sometimes but uh, I, if i can just continue devotional service so here in the bhagavad gita 10th chapter verse number 10 and 11 this 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 is referred to twice it says a person may have a bona fide spiritual master and may be attached to a spiritual organization but still if he's not intelligent enough to make progress then krishna from within gives him instructions so that he may ultimately come to him without difficulty the qualification is that a person always engage himself in Krishna consciousness and with love and devotion render all kinds of services. He should perform some sort of work for Krishna and that work should be with love. 
if a devotee is not intelligent enough to make progress on the path of self-realization, but is sincere and devoted to the activities of Krishna of devotional service, the Lord gives him a chance to make progress and ultimately attain to him. And then it says in the next verse, text 11, but even if a devotee does not take advantage of their literatures or of his spiritual master, if he is sincere in his devotional service, he's helped by Krishna within his heart. So the sincere devotee engaged in Krishna consciousness cannot be without knowledge, cannot be without knowledge. The only qualification is that one carry out devotional service in full Krishna consciousness. So is, the, the, the point is, as long as they don't go away from devotional service, even though if occasionally they have fall downs, there's still hope for them. Yeah, but, but what, what is the breaking point is if they say, well, it's Prabhupada's fault, you know, he brought this uh, antiquated uh, following of Krishna consciousness that might have worked, you know, in the 1890s, but it's, it's, it's not relevant to modern society. <laughs> so those type of speculative theories cuts them off from Krishna consciousness. Yeah. I mean, it's a long huh? It's a long purpose. Oh, there's more to it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.